This is Kristen O'Brien, and you're listening to the NFX Podcast. Today, James Courier and Reid Hoffman discuss the path ahead for founders in a post-COVID world, what you need to learn and unlearn to get your company through a crisis, frameworks for the tough decisions founders are facing today, and the way they see the world changing forever, opening new opportunities for savvy founders. Reid is the co-founder and was executive chairman of LinkedIn and is now a partner at Greylock. Let's jump in. Reid Hoffman, you need no introduction. You and I have known each other for, I guess, almost two decades now. You and I are both members of the Henry Crown Fellows Program, where we're, we're really big fans of combining tech with humanities and uh, humanism, basically, and, and philosophy. One thing you said recently I wanted to start talking with you about is, is you know, in, the, in this time of, of change, you said be human first. And since since our, our our stuff at NFX is about early stage founders, like when you think about being human first, what does that mean for early stage founders during this time? Well, so part of the reason I said that is because the normal and very appropriate way of for founders thinking about their businesses is to be thinking you're all in, you know, you're at a 150, 200 percent. Uh, it's the organization and the business first. And part of that's because, you know, this this expression that I use that's now widely attributed, which is a startup is like jumping off a cliff and assembling an airplane on the way down. You need to be totally focused on, yeah, we, there isn't balance in my life. I'm really making sure that this, 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 this entity starts going and nothing like integrity and all the the rest of the stuff matters, but like just turn the rheostat up to 11, you know, put all your energy in, all your sweat, all your tears, all your blood, make it happen. And then the people you're recruiting on board, you're basically asking for the same kind of commitment, the same belief in the mission. And that is by and large the exact right way to be an early stage founder. On the other hand, when you get to unusual circumstances like this, you say, well, actually, it's not a question about like whether or not you're relaxed on a Friday evening. It's not a question about whether or not you're, you know, maintaining your hobby while you're doing your business. It isn't a question about like, well, in a couple of years, when I get this going, I can take, you know, kind of a mini sabbatical or like a little bit of downtime. And I got to be all in seven days a week now. Now, the question is, well, what's going on with public health? What's going on with disease? Uh, Your family is probably under unusual stress, right? Uh, Kids, your partners, um, what's going on with your your grandparents, you know, your parents, like all these things are going on that are like, okay. The network that has normally supported you now needs your support because you're the one who's the founder, who's got the strength and the knowledge and the energy to do these things. People around you now need you. Exactly. And so, and so part of the thing that to, to, is to set back from this normal reflex, which is the right thing to be in, and say, look, look, as I go to each day and as I get to each decision, I go, look, what's the what's the thing that I should do as a human being first? And yes, maybe I'm taking a little bit of extra risk with the company, a little bit of extra risk with a startup. That's fine. In these circumstances, you know, you make that decision first. And it could be anything from, you know, everyone's trying to work from, you know, when they're sheltering in place, work from home. But it's like, look, they got kids the kids interrupting them, <laughs> you go, look, do you make sure, like, are you trading off with your with your partner well and, and, and managing kids? Are the kids doing okay in the stressful thing? Like, you know, how do I help you be as productive as you can, but while I know that you're going to be spending time on these other things, and you should be, and if you're not, I'm going to be encouraging you to spend time on it because that's that's what matters in these times. That's the human thing to do, yeah. 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 And, does, and do you think it extends to um, to how you – how you might reduce your force. You know, a lot of these companies are having to do layoffs. Yes, in a couple of different ways. So one is, how do you make decisions around rifts? Um, now, sometimes you just have to, it's full stop. One thing is the question is, is there some industries which are just kind of as were, you know, slaughtered by kind of the staying in place? Travel. Travel is an obvious one. You know, sometimes it'd be like, uh, like you're a, a SaaS business serving small businesses. Well, okay, small businesses, a lot of them are going to be intensely um, uh, impacted. And so you might go, look, I have to do a riff because like there is like, there's just like the recovery pattern here for me is at least a year out, (laughs) right? It isn't like in three months, we're going to get to a place where it's like, well, okay, it'll be like a recession, right? 20, 30% down, growth rate slower. It's like, no, 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 this is slaughtered and I have to do that. But then, okay, the next question is, is okay, when you're doing a riff, are there options to do things like furloughing? Are there options to do reduce salary, reduce bonuses? You say, look, this is what we're going to do and people can sign up for it or not. 
<laughs> you know, that's the the next level down on it. And uh, because then you could say, look, we we keep more people in place. And then they then the next layer below that is you can kind of go, well, you know, is there you know, kind of ways that I can help people kind of get their next jobs. Like we're going to do a reduction in force, but we're going to find the resources, give them the resources, actually ask people in the in the company to say, hey, be a reference. If there's other things you know about, you know, refer people to them. We're going to do things to, to try to help that transition. So I think it goes the whole stack down on riffs. Now, at the end of the day, you're doing no one any favors if you say we don't do a riff and then the thing just goes out of business in two or three months. That's That doesn't help anybody. So actually, in fact, you know, I've a couple of my startups have done riffs. It's, it's working through it. It's it's applying all these principles in terms of how you're doing it. Oh, and then the last point, which is the the kind of the point that I was making. The first thing is sometimes people go, well, oh my God, uncertainty. We just got to go, we got to plan on no revenue for six months. And for the majority of our tech businesses, if you're really planning on no revenue for the next six months, that's a different universe. So I tend to say, don't plan on that. Plan on really challenged and recession, but don't plan on no revenue. Like if we're in a place where where a B2B business and, you know, kind of enterprise and everything has no revenue for six months, then you're actually, you're in a different place altogether as an industry, as a society, everything else, and we'll be sorting things through there. So with that plan, you also monitor because maybe you're, maybe I'm wrong. So you go, okay, fine. We, we won't plan on no revenue for six months. We'll plan on no revenue for a couple months or, or you know, uh, two, uh, takes two X as long and is only uh, 60 or 70% uh, as much revenue as you're getting, and that's what we'll plan, but we'll be monitoring to see if it's right or not in order to recorrect. Got it. And so what are some of the things that people you think need to be unlearning right now? If you're an early stage founder, you said, look, normally you're operating in one mode, which is just the go-go mode. <clears throat> now you need to be a little bit more human and, and realize that they need your support as much as you needed their support before when you were out slaying the dragon. What are some of the other things that we need to unlearn? You know, the, the mental patterns that we need to, to throw out the window. So typically, what you try to do as an entrepreneur is you try to simplify the problem that you're doing. You try to have a, a specific set of hypotheses that you're testing, usually around product market fit or scale product market fit. Uh, sometimes, you know, micro ones on, oh, I'm going to hire this person who, who I think has the talent, although not the experience, they're going to learn. Like there's a set of things that you're, you're testing. The problem is that you have to kind of now do is you have to realize that there's a set of things that you're going to be that you think you'll be learning now that you won't actually really learn. They're different. They're unique versus repeatable things, although you have to learn and adjust and adapt to the new circumstances. And you have to be thinking about like, okay, so what are the things that we're going to do that are now that are just getting through the the worst of this crisis? What are the things that we can now learn that we wouldn't have prioritized learning, but we're good to learn now? Like, so for example, a really classic one across the whole startup universe is, well, we should really learn remote interviewing. We should learn, you know, to say, okay, you know, separate from the circumstance, we wouldn't have bothered learning remote interviewing. It's just not a skill that's on the short list of priority, but we'll do it now. And that could be helpful to us as we're recruiting talent from across the country, around the world, opening up new areas like learning distributed work. Some places really should learn distributed work very early. Some places shouldn't bother learning distributed work until much later. Well, we're going to learn that now. And then that could help us with talent and being in Boulder or in Austin or somewhere else at the startup. So it's kind of a, a shift of mindset about which things you're going to learn now, why you're going to learn them, learning them for just the crisis, learning them for repeatable work. And those are the kinds of things to kind of trade mindset. Now, the other thing, of course, is the generalization of the point that I just made is to say, like, for example, in typical world, your startup's making progress, you're going to get financing. There's enough focus on entrepreneurship, new products, like we've shot product market fit, we're going to scale, we're gonna, you'll get, it may not be the pricing you like, it may not be from who you like, but you'll get financing. Now, one of the things is external financings are going to be very difficult through probably the uh, at least August, maybe if you're really lucky, it's July, September, October. I think pricing may get reset, but it's but it's there. I think it will be back there. But in that interim period, new financing from a new player is super difficult. And so I've seen a couple of them happen, and the and there are two categories of which I've seen happen. One good for NFX, and the other is scale companies where investors have been pursuing them for over a year. I said, well, we're going to do a round of financing anyway. And they go, look, we've been wanting to be in, the, be in this company for a year anyway. We're going to go in no matter the fact. So where, where, the, where the VCs know the founders already and have an established rapport and knowledge of the business. And have been pursuing. Yeah. And then the other one is Series A's. 
And the reason why uh, smart folks are still doing Series A's is because they go, look, as long as we make sure that we're, we're doing a Series A with 18 months plus of capitalization, so that we're on the other side of this, then you got a pricing mismatch. Maybe the pricing is going to get hit a whole lot more than we think now and what the pricing is. So we may make an error in pricing investing now, but the things we invest in now, we'll get money later. And so those are the only two. Other than that, no external financings that I've seen. Yeah, right. And the companies with the Series A's, I mean, the money becomes a competitive weapon. Yes. Right? Yep. As others are skimping or laying off or pulling back, if you've just raised a Series A in this time, then you're going to have a little bit of an edge in moving forward in the markets that are moving. Yep. And the one thing I would add to the companies that did raise a Series A, get that money to last you minimum 12 months, preferably 18 plus months from now. We're saying 24, but yeah, I think that's right. I think 18 and 24 is probably right. Now, one of the things that people have been telling us they're learning right now that they hope to keep after the crisis is the DNA of frugality. It's learning how to keep costs down, reviewing, you know, the software subscriptions that everybody's signing up for, you know, real estate cost containment, not over hiring, that sort of thing. Number one, do you think that that's a good thing to learn? Number two, how does that play into uh, the blitzscaling concept? Because I know that would be, an, in a way, an opposite. I think I think probably Jeff Bezos has done both, but very few do both. How would you um, see frugality as being a, a new learned behavior? I mean, in the Depression, my grandfather, my grandparents learned to, you know, be very frugal, and they stayed that way their whole lives. Learning frugality is a good and smart thing to do. This is actually, you know, one of the things that we in Silicon Valley get a little too lazy at is because there's so much capital and capital's there because it knows it generates a bunch of results that, you know, relative, you know, you and I have known each other 20 years. Back when we started this, oh my God, capital was extremely important. Right, there was about 120 venture firms. <laughs> yes, exactly. And you were watching every dollar because it really made a difference. Yeah. And now you're like, well, hey, you know, rents are expensive. Uh, we'll still get the nicer place and it'll be more expensive. And there tends to be more of that. And it's good to really be like strategic about capital is expensive, sometimes impossible to get like a, you know, kind of a pandemic, you know, adjustment period. And we should spend it as carefully as possible. And that's always a good thing to learn. Now, that being said, within blitzscaling, there's two kind of I, two things in it. One is blitzscaling's relative speed. It's a Am I moving faster than my competition at being the first to scale? Either my real competition or the potential emergent competition or that kind of thing. And, and that really matters in a bunch of markets, especially those with network effects, right? All uh, NFX. And so the first, you know, uh, we, we call these Glen Gary, Glen Ross markets. First prize, Cadillac. Second prize, Steak Knives. Third prize, you're fired. The difference between one, two, and three really matters. And so relative speed does really matter. Now, that being said, it's relative speed. So if all of a sudden... Capital's drying up, and you and and actually, in fact, everyone's being okay. We got to make sure we get to the right milestones. Then, what you're doing is not saying speed doesn't matter anymore. What you're saying is actually, in fact, I can now be more efficient in my capital spend and still be moving faster than my competitors. And that's the mindset that you need to essentially shift to with this. It isn't that the rule of first to scale really matters. Now, sometimes in your industry, it might be. You might say, look, actually, in fact, my uh, the one who's going to be the first to scale is the one who gets across the pandemic desert, the pandemic crisis. And the one who gets across it, actually, in fact, it's the survival of going across that matters. And that's going to be the speed because it's speed that compounds over time to scale, not speed today, speed this week. It's speed that is relative to when you've really established your scale product market fit and have gotten the flywheel and the engine going. Right. Relative to the market that you're in. Yeah. yeah, and competitors, and your competitors. Yep, got it. Yeah, yeah. Just just being the last one standing is often the uh, the path forward. Exactly. A lot of this is going to come and go, and I'm just wondering if you've got any ideas already about what's going to change around human behavior, work, or maybe social that you think you're already starting to see this adjustment being made how we work or how, how we're going to be social. Some things will drop away. People say, oh, we're going to get back to normal. Everyone's going to be at the bars, at the restaurants. We'll all be at the Golden State Warriors games within a year. It'll all be back to the same. Are there other things that you think that you can anticipate changing? Well, I th I tend to think the, the changes, we all see the changes that have happened, like shelter in place, much other stuff. The changes that persist 
tend to be the ones where there is either a a negative force to keep that in place or a absent of a positive where people kind of go, well, we were we were doing a bunch of that, but maybe we didn't need to do as much of it. So I tend to think that some of the changes will stay as I think I think there'll be a, a, a slower return in the events business because I think a lot of people and, and especially travel as well because the people think, like, well, actually, in fact, I can get a bunch of this done now that I've actually really had to dig into it, see how video conferencing works. You know, now I can get a bunch of that done this way. And that's actually much more time efficient for me. That still allows me to, things. And I think you'll see more virtual events still. Like before, when people said, hey, we're going to do a virtual event, like, ah, I'm just going to wait to do the in-person one. The in-person one's better. It's like, well, actually, in fact, maybe some of these events or some of these things I will do as virtual events. But I think that pattern, I think similarly distributed work, I think people will say they'll learn things like, well, actually, in fact, getting a day a week working at home or a day a week working with no meetings or a day a week or two half days, you know, doing no meetings and so forth. That's actually going to be much more productive. We're going to do that. And I think those kinds of things and the set of tools that go with it, I think will 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 play it out. It does feel like the days of the five day work week in the office are over for at least information workers. Yeah. Or at least a version of it that says, hey, we're going to focus on these kind of new pieces of productivity we found. And so even if we're all going to go to the office, we're going to actually do like, it's like, you know, no meetings Wednesday. So nothing, nothing scheduled that. So we can kind of work through uh, those things happening. I also think, by the way, unfortunately, it's one of the things we need to put most attention to is I think the restaurant business will come back more slowly in part, because I think people will have the residual worry about, well, what happens if the disease kicks off again? And this is compact space. It isn't so much the didn't like the restaurants, didn't, didn't didn't enjoy going and seeing people. It just I think it will be a a slower return. In which case that will be a it's an industry that employs a lot of people, uh, provides a bunch of service and glue within the culture of the community. And I think that will be one that will be in terms of life will be slower as well. Yeah. And given that some of these things are going to change and uh, and persist, are there things, are there opportunities you see for the startup founders? A lot of people talking about, oh, I got to do a riff or I can't get capital or you know, it's it's hard for me. Well, yeah, it's hard, but where's the opportunity within that that changing landscape? Are there some things you see people doing? Uh, there are. Um, I, that's a little bit of the reason I was mentioning, like remote hiring and interviewing. You know, kind of patterns for asynchronous or distributed work, the tools and improving the tool set. You know, kind of getting the you know how do we make the two to three hours of work by my without interruption efficient, <laughs> right? As part of productivity, like all those things will persist. A lot of people tend to say, oh, we're going to do stuff because it'll be the the market driven by the pandemic. And, you know, obviously there's some areas where that's super important, uh, testing equipment or kind of measurement diagnostics that maybe it's just for a while. There's a bunch of the stuff that's like, no, no, you got to think about like, like the real product market fit that you're always working towards is two to three years out. And as part of that kind of two to three years out, you got to think, all right, I know things are going to be weird this year, but what are they likely to be like next year? And in which case, target that. And that's a little bit like the earlier lesson I was mentioning is like, there's some things that will look like lessons this year that are actually only lessons for this year, not lessons for 2021. And you won't fully know. You have to make a informed, you know, intelligent risk bet on it. But that's the kind of thing to do. And so I think patterns of work, patterns of company operations, I think will be persistent. I think some parts of uh, product market fit will be persistent, but some will also just be uh, highly volatile. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've seen a lot of companies renegotiating all their contracts down to lower their total cost basis. We've seen them resetting all the salaries, including the founders, Yep. down. We've seen uh, some of the companies go after competitors, just directly go after their competitors saying, okay, we're going to take market share. Yes, exactly. Because they're on their heels and we can choose to be on our heels or we can choose to be more aggressive. Yep. Um, I've seen some, some of these companies are, are moving to virtual products. So these these events planning company, they're, they're, they're moving toward, you know, how can we turn this into, you know, using WebRTC, how can we now create a product that does something uh, digitally that we used to do physically? Yes. Um, and, and so that some of these major pivots, I think, are giving opportunities in the desert at this point. Yeah. And I, and I think that's totally smart to do. It's good to recognize this is a wildly different time. It's not the only super crazy people think that two months from now, it'll be just back to like where it was in January. That's the that's the insane point of view. 
Now, some things are more opportunities. Some things are, are because like, for example, your competitors might be really slowing down, et cetera. You've raised the Series A, your competitor hasn't. You have an ability to, to grab customers, do things. You have ability to figure out a go-to-market motion that that may actually, in fact, be, be lighter weight and more uh, globally distributable. Like these kinds of things, those are good opportunities to grab. And then sometimes you also have to say, well, but actually, in fact, we also have to focus on cost and longevity. Yeah, totally. And are there some areas, Reed, where you think that founders should be focused on in terms of making an impact over the next few years as we come out of this next year or the year after um, where where there are startups that are needed to put people back to work or there are startups that are needed that, that might not exist? And I mean, certainly all this... I mean, we've, we've seen a, a torrent of sort of remote working applications in the last few years already. Um, it's always hard to know which ones of those will catch on and be big. Yep. But beyond that, are there areas you think that uh, founders will start to see, you know, a greater return to speed that could really make an impact? You know, the natural impulse for most people is like, how do I like get medical tests to, you know, the hospital, you know, uh, equipment to the hospitals, which was a very good thing to be doing a month ago. How do I finance science and vaccinations and inoculations? You know, how do I support my local uh, restaurants and so forth? And I tend to think that the, the, the top focus, obviously, for most startups should be is like, look, if I can get a really good business going, I'll be creating jobs. That'll be a, a, a back to work kind of thing for people. Uh, and that that is actually a super important thing for me to do. And I shouldn't get too distracted. Now, that being said, on a kind of a secondary order, it's kind of the we're going to make our products free for hospitals and first responders when we're going to be catering at our kind of startup as we're going back to work, we're going to make sure that we're going to be ordering uh, food from from restaurants around, like choose some restaurants to help get back on their feet. And we're going to be a persistent orderer from them, <laughs> right, as we're doing. I think those things are also very good to do. But things that kind of say, you know, I'm focused on my startup and my business first because that creation of jobs and industry I mean, we're going to be in an X quarter's recession. And the question is, is it a small number, a number of X or a large number of X is the only real uh, question with that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, I think it's um, it's an instinct to try to take care of everyone around you in the, in, the, in the micro. And I think this idea that just by creating a scalable enterprise and creating a foundation that could produce hundreds, thousands of jobs in the future is actually quite an ethical thing to do. Yep, exactly. And it's important. And it doesn't mean that you don't care, right? You care deeply and you could do things as you can to help. But that the only th way that this recession really gets back and that like, you know, the SMB jobs get recreated and everything else is that we move out of recession back into the normal growth of an economy. And that sometimes you have to have a long-term focus for that. Yeah, no, agreed, agreed. It does feel as if, what you're saying is that the the changes that we're going to have here for the next one need to be around the shelter in place because the economic impact of this, the economic virus that this is, may prove over the next two or three years to be more impactful than the virus itself. And we have no idea, but it, it, it could very well be. And the response of shelter in place is probably not the optimal response we can have. And so it's almost as if we need some cultural entrepreneurship not just entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, but cultural entrepreneurship to shift what our playbooks are as a, as a community and a society. Yeah, we're in the emergency playbook, which is the, we fumbled, right? We're going, you know, set back. I mean, like the kinds of things would be is say, well, look, the moment that we see that we a pandemic start to happen, you say, look, uh, we're going to shut borders for the moment and we're going to ramp up testing intensely. Like we go, for that, we need to make sure that we have high testing capability. And and by the way, if we'd done that here, we might have been able to shut the borders, like just shut the borders of the U.S. for a week, ramp up testing, be capable on healthcare stuff, and it would have been an entirely different curve that we were in. Yeah, the the, the network here is interesting, also though, because because this uh, virus connects all the countries. If one country tries to do you know herd immunity, and the others don't do that it creates a lot of suffering for the ones that try to do shelter in place while someone else is just out frolicking and then their people are spreading the virus around. So it's interesting, the sort of network effects, if you will, the different cluster implications of of, uh, of how everyone's policy rolls out because we're all interrelated now. A hundred percent. It basically says doing shelter in place doesn't really help you very much unless you also close the borders, right, for that relevant time. And one of the weirdnesses in the U.S. is you got some states 
you know, California, Washington, now New York, going, okay, we're going to do the shelter in place. And then, okay, well, what should we do? Should we then say, okay, no one from any of the other states is allowed to come unless you've gone through your own quarantine process? We're not going to allow it. Baseline intelligence to say a quick, brief shelter in place coordinated then actually has the least economic impact and the highest impact on the R naught of the spread of the virus. And we need to at least understand the math behind that and then educate the decision makers about that at every stage. So when the next one comes, they're ready for it. Yes, exactly. Do you think there's any role that uh, Silicon Valley has in what happens next? Or is everyone just mad enough at Silicon Valley at this point about our social media and all the chaos that that causes that our voices just aren't really welcomed anymore? You know, crises come with opportunities. And obviously people were pretty decades of, of the of the young swashbuckling technology entrepreneur being the hero, Dread Pirate Roberts or the, you know, the Johnny Depp character where it's actually heroic. And then, you know, the last five plus years has been, you know, the tech lash and people pretty angry across a number of things like, you know, did social media break democracy and truth telling did, um, is the disbalance of wealth you know, causing uh, extra suffering and we're not taking responsibilities for the things we should be doing. And some of that tech lash, I disagree with. I think some of it's, you know, the media being uh, extra unhappy because people aren't paying as much attention to the media as they like, or the business models are being challenged and those kinds of issues. And so they, they amplify that without, you know, kind of taking honest responsibility for that being part of the, the, the perspective and motive there. But I think that the opportunity for Silicon Valley is to say, look, step up and help people in this crisis. Like, what are the things that we, like, we as a valley, what are the things we can doing in terms of, you know, kind of uh, helping people get back to work, helping with jobs, you know, helping with, you know, vaccines and inoculation and pandemic, helping with information. Like, you know, you you see some defensive game going on right now, which is like, well, let's, let's stop the spread of bad pandemic information, right? Which is the kind of thing that the social networks need to be doing more of, which is, you know, stop the flow of what is just very clearly bad information anyway. But let's also now figure out how to help. How do we get good information? How do we build those trust things? Like, So like, what are the things we can do where people said, okay, you stepped up and you did a lot more than you had to do, right, than the minimum to help the rest of us navigate this pandemic. And I think there's an opportunity there and I think people should be doing it. Yeah. And is there something that's going on that's really unnerving to you right now? What's the thing that sort of stands out as, wow, you know, um, that's something we need to stop right away. Or that's a that's a mindset or an attitude or a set of language that's... You mean within Silicon Valley? Within Silicon Valley um, in particular. Just stay focused on the, the environment that these early stage founders are in. They're listening to this. Well, this may be less the early stage founders, but the one that I've been particularly irked about is that Silicon Valley, because of its focus on the future, has has been beating the drum on you know UBI, universal basic income. And the way that they've been beating the drum is this kind of really terrible marketing. It's like misleading and terrible marketing. It's like, hey, we're creating all these technologies that's going to take all these jobs away from you, but don't worry, we're going to put you on welfare. And it's just like... Oh my God, run, you're wrong. The the speed at which the jobs are going to be taken away and change is not the speed at which you're envisioning. I understand you understand the speed because of the, the speed at which the technology industry moves. But like take one of the favorites, which is like truck drivers. Like right now, there's a massive shortage of truck drivers. And you say, well, but AV is going to take that away. It's like, well, yeah, okay. When the autonomous vehicle trucks start getting manufactured, 10 years from then is when they're going to be at rough scale that actually, in fact, the truck driver industry will be hit. Okay, so when's one of those trucks going to be manufactured? I don't see it in the next couple of years. Like maybe it'll be manufactured in the next couple of years and that will be the first one, not the scale manufacturing line store. Stop with this, like say, hey guys, don't worry about the tech industry because we're all going to put you all on welfare. Stop with that discussion. Say, look, there's a lot that we're doing with technology. It's going to be creating new jobs. It's going to be now. There's going to be adaptability. There's going to be transition. It's like the same transition from agriculture to industry. There's going to be pain, and we're going to need to help with that. And we're going to need to participate because yes, it's not to say there's zero pain, but that the UBI thing is a ways out. And by the way, the precise limitations of the pandemic uh, response of kind of writing minimum wage checks will show the exact current gap between now and a Star Trek future of UBI. Because if you go to most people and say, would you like six weeks of minimum wage check? The answer is absolutely yes. Of course, I'd like that. Would you like that? Or would you like your job back? They're like, I'll work out what the six weeks works like. Give me my job back. 
<laughs> right? I really need the job. That's what we're going to see. And so that would what I would say. Now, that's not a Silicon Valley activity thing as much as a way that we talk to the rest of the world. Yeah, no, it does feel tone deaf to realize, to, to suggest that people don't get meaning out of their work. Yeah. And that they're going to be happy on welfare. Yes. And, and actually, in fact, the truth of the matter is there's going to be a lot of work for at least the next 20 years and probably longer than that. And so the next 20 years, well, 20 years is like 20 years is half a career of someone who's graduating this year. So instead of uh, having no jobs, it's just a matter of having to adapt to new types of jobs every 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 years. You know, and, and, and how to help with that is the actual focus. Anything else that's going on that's unnerving you? Is there anything that the VCs are doing that's that's uh, bugging you? Or Well, not particularly. I mean, I do think that I, I'm less of a fan of what some VCs do, which is go back and try to renegotiate drastically term sheets or other kinds of things. I get it, responsibilities, to LPs and so forth, but it's kind of a shared thing. And so I tend to think the the right approach is how do we share the pain in creating like what things is awesome about the industries we build and the thing we do as investors and the thing we do as entrepreneurs is we play these non-zero sum games and we go and build something that's that's new and much bet, bigger and additive. You know, one plus one is ten, not two. So that tends to be the share the pain. Don't say, well, okay, it's a zero sum game. You know, you're in a position where you're in dire need. I'm going to try to get every last penny out of it. It's like, look. You know, let's uh, let's let's share the the pain through this. And you know, some VCs are kind of going and and being a little bit more rapacious than they should be. It's more individuals than firms and so forth. But um, but that's not. I don't well, think it's the industry. It is interesting how people snap back into a zero sum thinking uh, sometimes in times of crisis. It's, it's so hard to train people out of it to begin with, and then snap back into it. Exactly. Yeah, I, I remember that um, moving out of Europe and the East Coast and finding how much non-zero sum thinking that is out here and how different that is, how fundamentally different that changes the human relationships between people. And, you know, maintaining that through ups and downs is, is pretty critical. And it's, it's a cultural thing. It's a, it's a learned thing. It's a, it's a network thing where because you feel that way, I feel that way, because the two of us feel that way, other people are forced to feel that way. But, but uh, it starts to break down and it can get bad. Quickly. Yeah, and, it, and there's a direct tie. Obviously, it's it's uh, it, they're, they're siblings between non-zero sum thinking and growth psychology, right? Because if you think that actually, in fact, the pie is growing, yes, you want to make sure that you get a good portion of the pie and everything else. But if the pie is growing, then it isn't a well if, uh, for me to win, you have to lose, right? And that that growth psychology, that non-zero sum thinking, is part of how we make progress in the world. And so, holding on to that and making that the way the world works is super important. Now, Reed, how much of your time are you spending investing these days? And what sorts of what sort of stages are you investing in? <laughs> there's a there's a these days pandemic days and there's a these days outside of pandemic days. So, these days pandemic days, you know, it's mostly working with the existing portfolio, my own across Greylock and so forth. There's a bunch of my partners are still out there really looking at at, at new businesses and so forth, but I'm kind of doing I'm probably playing more of a when a when an entrepreneur gets introduced to me right now, I'm like, "Hey, you know, meet Sarah Gua, you know, meet Josh McFarland, meet, you know, and I'll help them and work with them on it just for the 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 near pandemic days." Generally speaking, I'm uh, part of how I describe a venture investor to, to people who don't understand the business is you look at 600 to 800 deals a year and you do zero to two of them. The benefit of my network is I don't have to look at six to 800. I can look at a smaller number, but I'm still doing zero to two deals a year, just like every GP. Got it. Good for you. Well, it's been great to see you today, man. I really appreciate you taking the time out. Yeah, likewise. Look, the entrepreneurship stuff is really important. What you guys are doing at NFX is 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 great and really shining a spotlight on the things that matter. Building the new global world, these businesses with network effects really matter. So it's awesome. Yeah, well, it's great to see you, my friend. Thanks for the time and uh, we'll see you soon. Be well, be safe. All right, you too.